Welcome to this episode of the Missing Link for SLPs. If ever there was a ladder to climb in vocology and voice work, my next guest has climbed it. This is Mr. Dan Sherwood. He is a clinical vocologist at the John Hopkins Voice Center at GBMC. He has spent nearly 13 years as an on-air radio personality, heard his voice more than once, and that is part of his SLP story of origin. That is why he changed professions and became a voice specialist. He opted for a helping profession working with professional voice users. He received his master's degree in speech pathology from Marquette University in 1999 and also studied voice at the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music 2001 to 2003 and he earned his vocology certificate from NCVS in December, Colorado in 2003 and trained with Arthur Lesek in 2004. He is a certified hand-somatics practitioner and incorporates this work as well as his training in associative awareness technique and optimal breathing into a holistic approach to vocal therapy. He has presented at national and international conferences on incorporating mind-body practices into traditional vocal rehabilitation. So, one of 200 vocologists in the entire world. This is truly a voice interview to behold. So welcome, sit back, and enjoy. Welcome to the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today's episode is part of the SLP Spotlight series where I talk with SLPs in a variety of SLP positions and settings, doing things that we knew SLPs did, but also working in areas that we've never thought or heard of SLPs working in. It is amazing the opportunities these SLPs have taken and where their careers have gone. This is storytelling time. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast, The Missing Link for SLPs. I am here with Dan Sherwood, who is one of those voice, like I've arrived at the top of my career, vocologist, works at John Hopkins Medical Center, Voice Center. Welcome, Dan, to the show. Hi, thanks, Maddie. Thanks for having me. It's, it's really great to be here. I'm glad that you do this podcast. I love doing this podcast. It is something I look forward to on the days I get to talk to guests like you. You have a background prior to speech pathology of 13 years in the media field, correct? Uh, that is, uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, correct. Yes, I was in radio for th almost 13 years on one of those uh, you know, top 40 on the air, six days a week, screaming teen god maniacs. Uh, put my voice a couple of times and kind of discovered my current profession, uh, you know, by accident, the hard way as, as a patient originally in the early 90s. Oh, no. That, so that's how you were introduced to the field? In a way, yes, yes. Back, this was probably 1992 when, uh, you know, I was just, I didn't know anything about the voice. I was just some guy just babbling away, playing new kids on the block when they were brand new. And uh, they were the new kids. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, you know, so I was just on the air every day and I'm just just going for it. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was having a lot of fun. And as a result, over all these years through the 80s and 90s, you know, I, uh, I've i got just a little bit of scar tissue on, on my vocal cords just uh, because, uh, you know, some chronic injuries. And, and again, I didn't know what I was doing, but uh, I had a program director at one point in about 1993 and his fiance was a speech pathologist in the public schools at the time. And she loaned me her book, her one book from her one class in voice work from, from when she was in school. And it was Laboon and McFarland, you know, voice and voice therapy. And I read that with such fascination. And I learned a few things from there and combined it with some of the stuff I remember from, from a broadcasting school. And basically I fixed myself and I was able to continue my broadcasting career for about another four or five years as I Ran away back to school at the age of 30 and worked my way up. And, uh, you know, here all the, after all these years, I'm a speech pathologist specializing in voice. Wonderful. I went back myself at an older age. So uh, good thing for those who come back for a second career. 
So you are now, tell us where you are now, because your resume is very impressive and the bio that's going to be in the show notes is very impressive. Yeah, sometimes I, I like to make a joke about it. If you take the DSM-5, open it to any random page, that's my resume. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, I, I right now I'm at the Johns Hopkins Voice Center, which is uh, located at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. You know, there are three different locations of the Johns Hopkins Voice Center. So there's the main campus, and then there's the campus where I work, which is basically the crown jewel. If you saw it, you'd know what I was talking about. And then there's another uh, another uh, clinic in Bethesda, Maryland. So there are three branches of it, but it's all under the same umbrella. So can you tell us a little bit more about your story of origin as an SLP? Why did you want to become a speech pathologist? Um, basically, you know, I, it's funny, I, I started out thinking I, you know, maybe you know, when I left radio, because again, I was hurting my voice and, you know, I, I helped myself, but uh, I didn't know anything about speech pathology or voice work until I read the Boone McFarland book and it was fascinating. So, you know, as, as any good uh, student, I, I looked through the bibliography and, and found out uh, that all these other different kind of sources and books to read and articles. And it was just fascinating to me about uh, the human voice and, and how it works and what you can do with it. And unfortunately, what can go wrong with it, but also things you can do to fix it. So I kind of snuck in the back door. You know, I, I had gone to broadcasting school back in the in the 80s and back when my beard was all black. I don't know what happened. Um uh, but yeah, just fascinating me. But originally I thought I wanted to be a chiropractor, uh, because, you know, working with the human body, but mm -hmm. the more I read, the more I experienced, I realized, you know, voice is a product of the body, not a product of the throat. So I went from there. So I, I moved into speech pathology. Once I realized where voice work was really done therapeutically. Interesting. Very interesting approach. I've I've never thought of it that way, but that's very true. That's very true. So you went back to graduate school, and did you know from the very beginning you wanted to be a vocologist? Uh, well, I certainly didn't know what that term meant, you know. And then, uh, you know, I met uh, you know these wonderful people back in in the nineties who, uh, be, you know, basically started the vocology sort of profession. Linda Carroll, who is now in New York, is mm -hmm. one of the big gurus, and Kitty Bernalini and Ingo Tietze and Jan Sveck. These are these are all my mentors. You know, they're they're my friends now. Uh, we've known each other for years and years. Um, but uh, just some of the amazing people who really generated this profession of speech pathology meets otolaryngology meets voice science. And it all just came together back in the, again, in the early 90s when the profession of vocology really got started. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I was, I was very excited. Just learn and learn and learn. So you said something a minute ago that kind of piqued my interest. You said we're all friends now. For the speech pathologist who is just starting in the voice field or in any, in any niche she's interested or he's interested in moving into, what advice or tips for networking do you have? Um, well, first of all, do what I did, read, read everything. Um, you know, it was kind of weird. I was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and, you know, one of those things where you, you know, how you, you get divorced and, uh, or you're suddenly single in a new town, you don't know a soul and you realize, well, what am I going to do with myself? And I decided I was going to read, you know, how we all, uh, tend to collect, uh, you know, our professional library over the years as we get started in our careers and we buy a book here and a book there because there's something that we want to read. So we read like a chapter or a section here, or a section there. And then we're like, okay. And we learn a little bit and then we just sort of put it on the shelf and it sits there. And I decided I had probably a dozen, 15 books related to speech pathology, voice work, swallow work, things like that. And I realized, okay, I need to do something with my time. And I realized, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I made a decision. This is kind of strange. I said to myself, I'm going to read every single professional library book I have cover to cover. I, that's what I'm going to do. That was my mission. So all of a sudden, Starbucks became my library. And I would go there every day for two hours, and I would just read. And I would read. I read all my books cover to cover, 
right? Not just what I thought I bought them for, but just literally cover to cover. And I had friends who worked at hospitals around town. I borrowed journals from them, the you know, Journal of Voice and the Dysphagia Journal. And I just read and read and read. And my learning just exploded. You know, I, I've often said, at least to myself, that our, our speech pathology programs in school teach us the language of the profession. Mm-hmm. And then our experience teach us how to actually become therapist and apply this language. But when I started reading and my clinical language really grew and I was so happy to learn the things I learned from, from authors all over the world and researchers and professors and therapists who were in the trenches and sharing their knowledge. And really my learning exploded and I was so happy. And that's really what steered me the rest of the way into voice work because the first few years of my career, you know, you take what you can get when you get out of grad school. So I was mostly a, a therapist focusing on swallowing, which I know a little bit about, but at the time I needed to learn so much more. And I was so happy to get exposed to all this material and just read and read and read and apply. And I was so happy about that. So then did you reach out to any of the authors and network that way? Yep. It was so funny. You know, a lot of authors who wrote textbooks about voice work, mm-hmm. I went and studied with them. I sought them out and I actually went and studied with them. And then I ended up in a lot of cases, I studied with the people they studied with. Oh, wow. Um, so it was just, I mean, American Express probably has a hitman going after me because <laughs> of all the money I spent in continuing education. Um, because, you know, I, I was in a place and I was in a place for a long time where your continuing education really wasn't funded very well. So I just had to just bite the bullet. And just every year I would go and do something a week long, two weeks, three weeks, one time, nine weeks, where I would go in these residential continuing education programs. When I studied with Arthur Lessack and his folks, when I went to the Vocology Institute with study with Ingo and his crowd, um, and I did my still voice training. I went to Italy for the summer of 2006 and sang my head off and, and drank great red wine. Um, but we won't talk about that. Oh. Um, yeah, so I've had some amazing experiences, you know, mostly funded out of pocket, I will say that, but it's been invaluable, you know, plus all the reading I've done, the access I've had to great literature, not just on voice from a speech pathology perspective, but from a vocal pedagogy perspective, from, from the uh, singing world, the acting voice world, and all the, the, really the whole world outside of speech pathology, the world of, of these alternative complementary bodywork disciplines, um, it's just fascinating what's out there and how it applies to voice work. I'll never stop learning, and I hope no one does. No, no, no. I agree. Lifelong learners. I am never bored. There's always something to learn, something to experience. Yes, I totally agree with you. What I understand you to be saying is you were very intentional with the reading, the expanding, the setting of the goals, the getting out there, the experiencing, and getting the knowledge that you needed to get to do what you do. True, true, because I I snuck into vocology sort of through the back door. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people who are voice therapists, especially like professional voice specialists, Mm -hmm. they had prior careers in, you know, as they're professionally trained singers, you know, opera singers and musical theater singers. Um, Some of them are trained like uh, actors and they have uh, they have uh, degrees in theater or they have DMAs, all these, you know, music degrees. I didn't study music. You know, I was just this guy in radio who uses voice for a living, but didn't know what he was doing. Um, So, you know, I used, you know, I just gobbled up continuing education anywhere I could get it. And I was just fascinated by the, how the voice works and, uh, and, you know, how we can make it work better and how it really is a product of the human body, not just this thing that comes out of our throat. So that's why I studied all these complementary alternative disciplines, you know, um, and I just read all this stuff outside the speech pathology or the kind of stuff you don't get CEUs for, but it's just incredibly valuable for making you a better therapist. And a more comprehensive approach, pulling everything in, more holistic approach. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, years ago when I was, uh, I wrote some articles for the advance for speech pathologists and for the somatics journal. And I kind of outlined this about, uh, you know, what does it really mean when you say outside the box approaches, especially when it comes to, uh, to voice work? And I said, this is what it means. And I've got pages and pages and pages of explaining what that means. Nowadays, we call that thought leadership. It's pushing the envelope on thinking, 
on problem solving, on finding resources that are applicable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, you know, it's funny. I often tell the story about I'm I'm surprised I ever got this job in the first place where I am now because I, you know, shot my mouth off of my interviews so much. I'm like, you guys want to be a better better voice therapist? Stop studying speech pathology, you know. And I'm just like rage against the machine. <laughs> they hired me anyway. <laughs> So tell us about your job now. This is a podcast for new speech pathologists or students. You are what so many speech pathologists and voice specialists want to become, and that is a vocologist at John Hopkins Voice Center. How does your, can you give us an idea of what your average day looks like? How many patients do you see? Etiologies, procedures, what do you do? Sure. Uh, my day and, you know, all of us on the voice team, our days are split in terms of the, um, the SLPs and our clinic is, uh, is a really nice setup. And I don't think there are very many clinics around the country that have a setup exactly like ours. There are several, but not really a whole bunch. So my day is usually half and half where I'll spend half a day in clinic with the laryngologist. We have three fellowship trained laryngologists that we work with. And so my day is spent in the clinic with them, say in the morning from eight to noon, where I'm, you know, taking a patient in, you know, the, the medical assistants will room the patient, get all their vital signs and history and all these things. And then I go in there, one of my colleagues goes in and we do the initial patient interview, get the history. Why are you here? What's going on with your voice? How may we serve? All this kind of stuff. And I'll do the initial exam after they tell me what's going on. We get all the acoustic measures, sometimes the aerodynamic measures, and then I'll do the exam. I'll say, all right, we're going to take a picture of your, voc of your vocal cords and we'll do either a rigid exam with the 70 degree, you know, scope or the, the nose hose with the, uh, the flexible uh, endoscopic scope through the nasal passage. We'll get good pictures of their vocal cords moving and vibrating. And then I'll go out and I'll brief the docs. Say, here's this patient is presenting with such and such, and here are their complaints, and here's you know what we saw. And so I have the exam saved on the on the strobe tower. And the doc will come in, they'll review and discuss and come up with the diagnosis, and then either recommend you know therapy or surgery or medication or some combination all, of all that. Um, and then the other half of my day, you know, whether it's morning or afternoon, is spent strictly in voice therapy. You know, and of course, lately, it's mostly about 90% Zoom kind mm -hmm. of uh, online therapies. But I do see the patient occasionally, you know, in the clinic because they come in and we keep our distance. And we wear our masks right now. But uh, there's some folks even today who just don't do Internet or Zoom or things like that. They don't get it. So we certainly will see patients uh, as needed in, in house right now, like we used to. Uh, but we've all coped with the, uh, you know, the new era we're in right now. Hopefully that'll end soon. We also do a lot of in-office procedures. So I will assist the docs with, uh, you know, um, in office-based injections to, for vocal cords, whether it's Restylane or Prolarin to bulk up cords. We do bulk tox injections in the office where I play the, the EMG tech there and hook them up and monitor that. We do in-office laser procedures where I play laser tech you know, for vocal, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, laryngeal papilloma or other uh, little uh, things that go wrong on a vocal cords that you can use a laser for. So we, there's a lot of things. We do a lot of in-office procedures. We do, uh, of course, we do fee studies. We do you know, biopsies. We do uh, transnasal esophagoscopies in the office, which is pretty involved, but we do that. So I'm like the tech there. A um, lot of stuff going on. Sounds like a dream job. Uh, well, and, you know, and then you have to do the paperwork and write the notes, you know. <laughs> Uh, so let's not <laughs> let's not oversell, but there, there is a lot of work involved because you have to document very yes. specifically and and timely. Yes, well, that's impressive. It's it's neat hearing from the expert on how a day would roll out and who you would see. So you have on your resume, because you sent your resume before, and again, um, for the listeners, go look at um, Dan's show notes. It's all in there, how you can contact him and everything. But there's several um, things you have after your name. Hannah Somatics, Associative Awareness Technique, Optimal Breathing Wholeness. Tell us about those things. That I, well, I, I, uh, you know, as, I, as I studied over the years, I, uh, one of the books I came across uh, one day was just a book called Somatics, you know, reawakening the body's ability to, to heal itself, basically. And uh, it was a guy named Thomas Hanna that wrote this book. 
and it was in the late 80s, I think he, he authored this book. But Thomas Hanna was the guy who brought Moshe Feldenkrais to the U.S. in the early 70s and organized the first uh, Feldenkrais training in America. So the Feldenkrais method is, you know, pretty well known in the voice world, especially like in uh, college drama departments and things like that, you know, for voice work, just kind of similar to the Alexander technique, you know, Moshe Feldenkrais and FM Alexander were contemporaries, you know, by and large. But it's, you know, again, one of these, you know, for lack of a better term, complementary alternative disciplines. So Thomas Hanna was a Feldenkrais practitioner for a number of years, all through the 70s and into the 80s. But he he was also a philosopher, believe it or not, he was a philosophy philosophy professor. He was the chair of the philosophy department at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And he ended up moving to Northern California. And through his Feldenkrais work over the years, he, he added a lot of his studies in kinesiology and neuroscience, and eventually sort of gradually diverged away from straight Feldenkrais work and developed this whole system, adding some things. And basically what evolved into Hannah's somatic education. And so I call it Feldenkrais on steroids, basically. Um, so yeah, I became in the, uh, uh, probably about 10 years ago, I became, you know, I went through a big three-year training program uh, to become a certified Hannah somatic educator about how to, again, I, I presented at the Voice Foundation several years ago in Philly um, about this. It called it, you know, Hannah somatics and voice, you know, uh, free the body, free the breath, free the voice. And and that's really how it works, how, in terms of how voice is a product of the body. You get the brain and the muscles to start having a different conversation with each other when they become disconnected. And, you know, the body can heal itself, really. And then the voice and the breathing mechanism work a lot better. So I incorporate henosomatics into my, my voice work every day. In fact, it saves my butt countless times. <laughs> Sounds like a very applicable approach, very beneficial. Right, it is, it is. And then I've added all these other things I've learned over the years with these other, again, again, for lack of a better term, alternative complementary approaches, optimal breathing, about really how to get that flexibility out of the rib cage and the chest cage and really start moving some air to support voice and health because the way we breathe has a lot to do with how well we live and for how long. And then associative awareness technique. It's very, how can I say this? It's a little touchy feely but it's really cool in terms of what it can do to get the nervous system and the muscles to calm down uh, in terms of the limbic system in the brain and how, how it influences the body's muscles and ultimately the breathing mechanism and the voice. Um, and it really helps me, even if I don't use it specifically with a patient, I always use the principles right. because it's not about the stuff, it's about the principles. Right. So it changed my therapeutic language quite a bit, at the very least, and how I talk to patients, how I educate patients, mm -hmm. my approach to things, and how I document. My documentation style has really changed over the years, uh, and I really like to pass that along to my grad students. How has your documentation changed over the years? Uh, it's gotten so specific in terms of physiology, mm -hmm. right? I have a colleague who likes to call it the pay and die, you know, uh, style of documentation. You write your notes as if you, if you died, another clinician would come in and take over pretty easily to do what you've been doing with the patient. And to get paid, you have to write so third-party payers understand what you did right. and why you did it and how you did it. Right. Um, so right. it makes sense to them. Right. Right. I'm on board with you on that with the grad students that I supervise. I'm very um, big into if somebody were to pick up this chart or that report or that soap note, will that report stand alone on what you did, how the patient benefited and where you're going to go? Yeah. And I, I teach that to my grad students. You know, when you write, don't write generically, you know, therapeutic exercises to coordinate respiration and phonation. Well, what does that mean? You know, so I have them say, what? I have my grad students intern with me. What did you do? Explain it. Tell me exactly what you did. Tell the third party pair exactly what you did, why you did it. And then later in the objective section of the report, we write what their response was. But I really want to write very physiologically. And I, I teach that to the students who work with me, the grad students I get. Um, and they seem to to catch on pretty well. They, they're really smart, the, the folks I get. And they know uh, <laughs> why I'm doing this, why I write the way I write, and why I want them to write the way they write, so they don't get insurance denials, for one thing. 
right? My grad students are super smart too. I'm impressed because I don't remember being quite that smart when I was in grad school. Right, um, right. Or, or as tech savvy. They really, <laughs> really helped me to figure out all this technology. I know, I know. So I'm definitely on board with you for that. Tell me, um, are there any of these programs for a new student or a speech pathologist wanting to become more specialized in voice that she or he should add to their resume? Well, I, I certainly recommend studying, you know, training in all the all the canned, you know, branded therapy programs because they're so important. You know, the you know, the less like Madsen resonant voice therapy, any kind of the stemple based resonant voice therapy, of course, LSVT. You know, that's really uh, that's really grown and expanded. You know, so all all the basics you really need those. You know, the vocal function exercise you need to understand all the therapy programs because they're so based in in science, in what works. And they're very well researched, a lot of good efficacy studies behind them, and some included vocal tract uh, techniques, stuff like that. We need to understand these so we can learn to use them and finesse them for any given patient because the last thing we ever want to be is cookie cutter therapists. That's, that's a disaster. Right. Right. And so when, when we come to things like, you know, they, they use the term thinking outside the box. Well, what does that mean? You know, I was at a I was at a, a weekend workshop conference. Gosh, this is probably 13, 14 years ago, and it was about uh, paradoxical vocal fold motion, and a uh, whole weekend devoted to that. And during the the lunch break one day, they put everybody into different tables. They set up a diff- bunch of different tables around the room. It was kind of a working lunch, where everybody can go to different tables and discuss different aspects of paradoxical vocal fold motion. Mm-hmm. From a medical perspective, of speech pathology, therapy, research, you know, anything. There's a lot of different things. There were several different tables. but So I sat at the therapy table and listened to other people talk about some of the therapeutic approaches they use to deal with this problem. And they kept using the term, well, outside the box this and outside the box that, and blah, 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 blah. And I finally, I just sat there and I finally I said, if someone says the term outside the box one more time, I'm going to vomit. You have no idea what it means. So I went on for this whole tangent. Here's what outside the box means, blah, 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 blah. And I went on, on about breathing retraining therapy and all this other stuff that I had studied. And people were just sitting there with their mouths open, you know. So sometimes I don't make friends in the speech pathology world because, you know, Oh, I, yeah, that's the, I was working with, a, a, um, I have a coaching thing that I do. And a speech pathologist came, she said, well, you know, I, I'm working with a dysphagia client and they don't want to tell them that they've got that I'm not going to give him graham crackers. And he got really mad at me because I came three times and in each time he was asking me for graham crackers and I just didn't have the heart to tell him. I'm like, why? That's your job. You need to tell him how to be safe, how to manage safely what he needs to do. It's not our jobs to be friends with people. It's our job to you know be kind and compassionate and effective, but we also need to um, make those connections for people and educate Oh, exactly right. You know, sometimes, you, unfortunately, you have to tell people what they don't necessarily want to hear. Right. Uh, but it's it's based on, you know, what you've experienced over the years and what you've, have you seen people respond and what you really understand about their diagnosis and what their issue is. And right. yeah, it's it can be a challenge sometimes, but you have to be honest with people about uh, about what realistic goals might be given what their their issue is. Well, you truly have exemplified thinking outside of the box with these additional ways of pulling in with the training that you've done to com- to provide truly comprehensive voice therapy and support for the patients that you work with. Can you oh, tell us about your book? Um, well, yeah, this was something I did. I call it the 100 Mocha Challenge because I wrote almost all of it at Starbucks. Um I'd pretty much go there every Friday and Saturday night and just write and write and write. And I have a pile of books and papers and journal articles and for references and things. But, you know, basically it's because I, I, I usually take a grad student intern every spring semester. And, you know, how we just kind of teach them and mold them. And they wanted to be voice therapists. So I, I you know, and then just from, I guess, from that experience working with them, I, I decided, you know, I need to, you know, put something together for grad students who want to become voice therapists. So I got this whole premise of when I was a brand new grad student and, and just, you know, freshly minted right out of grad school, I, I wanted to learn voice work, but I had, you know, limited, you know, training. I had a textbook, one voice class. I had an undergrad 
one textbook I had as a grad student. And there was just, you know, again, very generic. They're talking about the, what the disorders are and all this stuff. And they barely really touched on any therapy. Um, so I thought to myself, well, what kind of book would I want as a new grad or just a speech pathologist who, you know, only sees voice patients a few times a year, but needs to know what to do. So what's the book I wish I had when I was a new grad student or a freshly minted SLP wanting to learn how to do voice work? So that's the book I wrote. If you're brand new to voice work or don't get voice patients very often, you can, even if you're not trained in the branded therapy programs, you can still help them. Mm -hmm. And here's how to do it. So I just kind of laid this out. This is the book I wish I had when I was a new grad wanting to learn how to do voice therapy, even though I hadn't really had exposure yet to the, the big official branded programs yet. So I, I tried to write it in that vein where it's very kind of blue collar language, you know, where I'm just, it's almost like I'm just having a conversation with one of my grad students and, you know, here's what to do. Here's a problem. Here's what to do. Here's some ideas. Here's an approach to take. Um, so I, I really, yeah, that, that's how I wrote it. Just, just very informal you know, here's how to do it. Even if you're not a seasoned pro, you can help someone. So the name of your book is? Uh, it's that Voice Therapy 411. Um, it's it's on Amazon. Um, I self-published it. I, you know, it was actually, it was accepted by a publisher in the UK. They, they accepted my book proposal and they took my manuscript. And then two years later, they had done nothing. So oh. I said, I'm not going to wait. I just threw it on Amazon myself. So it's out there because I think it I think it could be helpful for a lot of folks. Voice therapy 411. Now you and I were kind of laughing a little bit about 411. Tell us uh, what 411 means. Yeah, I remember what, well when I was growing up, I was I I'm born and raised in Southern California and uh, when you picked up the telephone and wanted to get a phone number, you dialed 411. That's information. information. So basically voice therapy information, voice therapy 411. Mm -hmm. Maybe a book that I'll put on my syllabus for my advanced voice disorders class. Um, like good book. I'll go look it up. I, I think it could be helpful for a lot of people because I, 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 you know, didn't I didn't try to get too crazy with it in terms of you know a lot of scientific you know jargon and all that. I just wrote it for clinicians by clinicians. I don't talk about pathologies and disorders. I talk about here's how to be a therapist. Here's how to do therapy. There isn't enough of that out there. I agree. And it was there was not a lot of that out there when I was in graduate school. We learned all about the disorders, but not what to do with the disorders. And so I found when I was starting to do voice therapy myself, um, it was it was um, I, I come from a heavy medical SLP background and I got in a bad motorcycle accident and I couldn't I couldn't with the broken bones I had, I couldn't keep up with the pace of the big medical centers I was at. So I switched and they said, well, do you do voice therapy? And I'm like, yes, I do. And so that's when I really began picking up the pieces of, of doing the voice therapy, but there wasn't a lot out there. So being able to implement, and I'm a firm believer in education. And if you can understand and absorb, then you can educate the patients why you're asking them to do what they're doing and why it's going to make a difference with their voice and help them achieve their goals. Right. And when you when you think about it like that, when you really approach it like that, then it, it sort of reignites your passion for your profession because you're never doing anything by rote. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, you know, all the, the learning I've acquired, the, the books I've read, the training I've gone to, um, the, the amazing people I've learned from and listened to both inside and especially outside the speech pathology world. Um, it's really helped me become a better therapist, but ultimately my patients teach me how to be a better therapist mm -hmm. because we have to be on the spot, think on your feet, go off the reservation kind of therapist to give people what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot just say, okay, I'm going to give this can therapy approach to this patient because they have diagnosis X or this can therapy approach because they have diagnosis Y. We've really got to learn how to nuance and finesse and cherry pick and, and develop things and sometimes just make it up off the top of our heads. You could be surprised how creative you can get in designing a, a customized therapy program for a, a given patient. As long as you understand the basics and the physiology and the pathophysiology and how you can work with it, there's amazing things you can do. And it's so much fun. And then so when you pass it off to the next generation, it's even yeah. more there's the title of the episode. You just gave it to me. You can't just hand a straw to everyone. 
Well, exactly. Because, well, how do they use it? What are they supposed to do? How do you know if they're doing it, you know, the most beneficial way? I mean, it, it behooves us to know not just the, funny when I uh, when I graduated from the Vocology Institute, this was back in 2003. It's funny. We all all of us, the group of us that finished that that year, we all went to that to that restaurant. I don't know if you're familiar with it's called Buca de Beppo. Yes. But yeah, that big Italian family style yeah. restaurant. So so we we're all sitting at this big round table and Ingo Tizza got up there and he was going to give his little graduation commencement address. And he stood there next to a next to a big bust of the Pope. <laughs> it was kind of funny. And he was saying, <laughs> because he was talking about voice there. He says he took he told all of us, now, you know, the principles, not just the recipes. And I have taken that advice forever that you've got to know the principles. The recipes will follow. You know, it's not just the stuff. It's not just the what, it's the how and also the why. Well, excellent. We are almost out of time. Would you have a story of a patient where you've been working with them and you're like, this is why I do what I do? Well, yeah, I, I probably can come up with something. Just in fact, just this past week, I had a woman who was probably early to mid 70s. I've been working with her. She's just, her diagnosis is vocal cord atrophy, you know, right? You know, in the, in the years after retirement, and we're not using our voices as much as we need, as we used to. And, you know, the vocal cords are like any other muscle in the body, right? Use it or lose it. So if we don't engage muscles in challenging and skilled activities, they have nothing to respond to. So the vocal cords can thin out and you don't get that complete closure. Your voice gets breathy and a little rough, a little effortful. So my most basic approach was kind of based on, you know, a, a hybrid of, you know, the LSVT and the Forte program to affect good forceful closure, good large amplitude vibrations. So I would have people really go for it, you know, turn up the gain in their voices, you know, whole body, whole system effort. So I, I worked with this woman a couple of times. We had maybe two or three sessions and I was basically taking her through that. Let's turn up the gain, the internal oomph, that neuromotor drive, they get your voice out so you can get a clearer, stronger voice with your whole body, not just engaging more muscles in the throat. Mm -hmm. And she would come back to me each session and say, oh, my throat just feels raw and irritated. Ah, and I, you know, we pressed on. But then I thought, wait a second. She keeps coming back to me with the same complaints. This isn't working for her. You know, we can't do this high effort phonation. It's just that's not right for her. So we let's back up and try something else. So I went back to my standard resonant voice therapy kind of stuff. And we went to the chanting, you know, that good morning, how are you? That, that big kind of monk in the monastery chant like feel. And that kind of cranks up the internal neuromotor drive right there. But it's also taking more advantage of the resonator to get that good ring in the face and the head and all those bones. Yeah. So we, that's the direction we went with. We, we got rid of the excess effort and we went with a resonance and it just sort of naturally occurred and she got a much better result in her voice. So that was just a nice moment of connection. She really responded to something. I thought that we should try one direction and she taught me that we need to try another direction. And she responded well and it worked and she was very happy. And I think we're gonna have some good therapeutic success. And that happens a lot. You have to be willing to step back from the from the recipes. And once you understand the principles, you can apply them based on what the patient needs. I was just going to say that. Yeah. You're understanding the principles and yeah. client-based, client-centered approach. Right, right. And, you know, with this whole idea of, you know, evidence-based practice, like we're only allowed to do what the, what the high brain room ivory tower people tell us to do, not a chance. We take the principles they teach us and apply them in any number of ways based on what the patient needs and what their complaints are. And I teach my grad students that all the time. I say, treat mm -hmm. the complaint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And treat the patient. Yeah, not the diagnosis. Right. 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 And then that, and then the homework, the, the outside of therapy activities are, if you base them around things that they do in their life, the generalization is just tremendous. Exactly. I have a whole chapter on that in my book, chapter five. It, it, uh, it talks a lot about that, about, I call it tying your shoes in the dark. <laughs> well, I'm going to go get your book. I'm excited to go. I'm going to click off of here and I'm going to go get that. It's, it's worth the price of admission. And I, you know, I, I really, uh, honestly, I, you know, when you talk about 
you know, clinical books and things like that for professionals, they're, they're way overpriced. Mm-hmm. I made mine extremely affordable. I'm not looking to make money off this. Nobody gets rich off these things. I just want to make a contribution to the profession. Mm-hmm. And it comes through loud and clear in your voice and the passion that you have for speaking with what you do, for what you do and for who you treat. So thank you so much for coming on today, Dan Sherwood. We appreciate your time and your passion and your talent. Thank you so much. I appreciate what you're doing to promote this and help speech pathologists become, you know, all the, the clinicians they are mm-hmm. designed to be. You know, we're, we're about helping each other and, and right. you know, being better human beings in the process. Right. Absolutely. That's why I created this. There was just this missing link between what students were learning in grad school and actually applying it in clinic. And there are so many people who are just wanting to make these connections and to make our world and the speech pathology world and our patients world a better place. So having that positive mindset, playing well in the sandbox with one another, it's just, it's been an honor and a treat for me to do this podcast. Oh, and, uh, and it's great. We're teaching people to, to show up for their patients every day, 100%. Show up with the intention to heal and to help and to serve. And you will be happy when you go home at night thinking, yeah, I, I made a contribution today. I made a difference. Absolutely. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Today's conversation has created some aha moments for you and motivated you to become a better SLP, continuing to connect some of those missing links between what you know and how to use that knowledge. Thank you for downloading the missing link for SLP's podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, I'd love you to subscribe, rate it, and leave a short review. Also, please share an episode with a friend. Together, we can raise awareness and help more SLPs find and connect those missing links and get the information needed to help them feel confident in their patient care every step of the way. Follow me on Instagram and join the Fresh SLP community on Facebook. Show notes are always available, so come learn more at freshslp.com. Let's make those connections. You've got this.